Income tax 2022-2023, rental property, special situation, condominiums, corporatives, and property changed to rental use. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from publication 527, residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes, tax year 2022. You can find it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, but just an outline, other forms and schedules flowing into these line items. One of those, the Schedule E, in essence, an income statement in and of itself. Rental income minus rental expenses, the net rental income flowing into line one income of the income tax formula. With rental real estate income, as with business income, we typically want to keep it separate from our personal activities, which helps us with our bookkeeping. It helps us with our planning and budgeting into the future. And of course, it helps us with our tax preparation. So in prior presentations, we've been focusing in on scenarios where we have a separate piece of property used 100 support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a youtube page we also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. 100% as a rental property. Now the concepts that we looked at in that type of scenario will typically apply even when things get a little bit more convoluted and then we've got to deal with the convolutedness such as situations where we have a personal use component for example if we use a property for rental property for part of the year and then we actually use it for personal use for part of the year like a vacation home kind of situation or if we have a situation where we live in a unit or live in a place but we rent part of it out now we have to be parsing out between business and personal we also could have situations where we have like common areas that we'll talk about okay so first let's take a look at the condominiums so a condominium is most often a dwelling unit in a multi-unit building but can also take uh take other forms such as townhouse or garden apartment so now you've got this unit that's in a building you own it you're not renting the unit but you own uh, the unit in the building so if you own a condominium you also own a share of the common elements such as land lobbies elevator and service areas so obviously if you think about a building you own a nice place in the condominium but you have to get up there to to to, to get to the place you've got the elevator you've got all the common areas uh related to the condominium those are those are owned in part by the owners of the condominium so now you've got this kind of community kind of situation that that is owning you know these common areas and then of course you own the unit exclusively so you and the other condominium owners may pay dues or assessments to a special corporation that is organized to take care of the common elements so now you've got this little political unit that's designed for the purpose of taking care of those common <clears throat> areas which everybody of course disagrees on how to do <laughs> but in any case special rules apply if you rent your condominium to others so you can deduct as rental expenses all the expenses discussed in chapter one and two in addition you can deduct any dues or assessments paid for maintenance of the common elements which kind of makes sense right if you have the condominium you rent out the condominium well now you've got the expenses related to the condominium that are that are similar to in other kinds of rental property but you also have these dues that are being paid which are basically required for the condominium so you would think you'd be able to deduct them as uh, rental expenses you can't deduct special assessments you pay to a condominium management corporation for improvements however uh, you may be able to recover your share of the cost of any improvement by taking depreciation 
Corporatives. If you live in a corporative, you don't own your apartment. Instead, a corporation owns the apartments and you are a tenant stockholder in the corporative housing corporation. So it's a different structure of ownership, which could have some benefits, but has some complexities attached to it as well. Clearly, it's a similar structure as we see in the business world with a corporation. So we can compare like a partnership, for example, to a corporation. If you have a partnership in a normal business setting, the partners own the partnership directly. Their percentage ownership is determined by their capital accounts and the partnership agreement. When we move to a corporation, we think of the corporation as a separate legal entity, which could lend some liability protection to the owners, the shareholders of the corporation, which is one reason to go to a corporation oftentimes in a normal kind of uh, business settings. And then the ownership of the corporation is going to be broken out into fixed units of shares, which make the shares easier to kind of uh, transfer oftentimes. And then someone's ownership in the corporation will be dependent on the number of shares that are owned in it. So you have a similar kind of structure here. Instead of valuing you know, your particular unit or owning your particular unit and then having joint ownership of some kind to the common uh, areas, you would think you can imagine the whole thing as basically one corporation kind of situation and your ownership uh, will be reflected by the number of uh, tenant stockholders. So once again, if you live in a corporative, you don't own your apartment directly. Instead, a corporation owns the apartments, corporations being a separate legal entity, but it's just an entity. And obviously <clears throat> you own part of the entity and you are a tenant stockholder in the corporate in the corporative housing uh, corporation. So you own stocks that's gonna be reflecting your value in the, in the, in the corporation. Okay. So if you rent your apartment to others, you can usually deduct as a rental expense all the maintenance fees you pay to the corporative housing corporation. In addition to the maintenance fees paid to the corporative housing corporation, you can deduct your direct payments for repairs, upkeep, and other rental expenses, including interest paid on a loan used by your stock in the corporation. All right, depreciation. You will be depreciating your stock in the corporation rather than apartment itself. This is where it gets kind of kind of messy here. It gets a little bit confusing because now you have the, the stocks that are representing, which are in a corporation, which are representing your property. So, so you want to be able to get the depreciation clearly uh, as an expense. So you will be depreciating your stock and the corporation rather than the apartment itself. Figure your depreciation deduction as follows. One, figure the depreciation for all the depreciable real property owned by the corporation. So we're gonna think about it as a full unit first and then kind of think about our share of the depreciation, right? That would, based on our, our the amount of ownership that we have. Okay, so depreciation methods are discussed in chapter two. So that would, the corporative would be doing their depreciation thing. If you bought your corporative stock after its first offering, figure the depreciation base, basis of this property as follows. A, multiply your cost per share by the total number of outstanding shares. B, add to the amount figured in A, any mortgage debt on the property on the, uh, on the date you bought the stock. C, subtract uh, from the amount figured in B, any mortgage debt that isn't for depreciable real property, such as the part for the land, because we can only depreciate the building. Two, subtract from the amount figured in one, any depreciation for space owned by the corporation that can be rented, but can't be lived in by tenant stockholders. Three, <clears throat> divide the number of uh, your shares of stock by the total number of shares outstanding, including any shares held by the corporation. So now we're t this is the ratio that we have now, right? Because it's our number of shares compared to the total number of shares out there. That's kind of our percent ownership, you would think, right? So four, multiply the result of two by the percent you figured in three. This is your depreciation of the stock. Okay, your depreciation deduction for the year can't be more than the part of your adjusted basis defined in chapter two. So uh, in the stock and your corporation that is applicable to your rental property. Payments added to capital account. Payments earmarked for a capital asset or improvement or other, otherwise charged 
to the corporation's capital account are added to the basis of your stock in the corporation. For example, you can't deduct a payment used to pave a community parking lot, install a new roof, or pay the principal of the corporation's mortgage. Treat as a capital cost the amount you were assessed for capital items. This can't be more than the amount by which your payments to the corporate, uh, corporation exceeded your share of the corporation's mortgage interest and real estate taxes. So you can see where kind of the complexity comes into play because now you have to parse out the the depreciation. You have to kind of figure what that's going to be. And then if there's improvements, if you're paying for improvements in the building, those again would usually be capitalized items that you would you would need to depreciate instead of expensing at the point in time that they happen. So your share of interest and in taxes in the uh, your share of interest and in taxes is the amount the corporation elected to allocate to you if it be reasonable if it be reasonably reflects those expenses for your apartment. Otherwise, figure your share in the following manner. So now you've got the uh, interest and in taxes that the corporative itself might do a reasonable allocation to try to allocate the interest and in taxes because now the corporation itself as the corporative, like as a separate legal entity is going to be dealing with paying the interest and taxes for everything, right? And you get, but you should be able to be deducting the part of the interest that's applicable to you and the taxes if you're renting your place in the corporative. So now the question is, well, how do you figure out your portion? Well, maybe the corporative itself will do that with some reasonable method. If they do not, then you got to calculate that. One, divide the number of, of your shares of stock by the total number of shares outstanding. That gives us your percent interest in essence, including any shares held by the corporation. Two, multiply the corporation's deductible interest by the number you figured in one. This is your share of the interest. So fairly straightforward calculation, not too bad. Three, multiply the corporation's deductible taxes by the number you figured in one. This is your share of taxes. All right, next situation. We've got property that's changed to rental use. So possibly it was personal in use and then we changed it to rental use. So the so the issue there often becomes around the basis or the cost of the property because you bought it some time ago. When you bought it, you bought it at fair market value. But now when you, when you uh, changed it to rental use, then the fair market value could have changed, for example, and you got to deal with that depreciation situation again. So if you change your home or other property or part of it to rental use at any time other than the beginning of uh, your tax year, you must divide yearly expenses such as taxes and insurance between rental use and personal use. So now you've got this mid-year kind of problem because you changed from, from personal to rental in the middle uh, of the year. So you can deduct as uh, rental expenses, only the part of the expenses that is for the part of the year the property was used or held for rental purposes. You can't deduct depreciation or insurance for the part of the year the property was held for personal use. However, you can include the home mortgage interest and in real estate uh, tax expenses for the part of the year the property was held for personal use when figuring the amount you can deduct on Schedule A. Example, so your tax year is the calendar year. You moved from your home in May and started renting it out on uh, June 1st. You can deduct as rental expenses 7 12th of your yearly expenses, such as taxes and insurance, which makes sense because that's 7 12th is the ratio of 7 over 12 months, right? The year that you uh, rented it. Starting with June, you can deduct as rental expenses the amounts you pay for items generally billed monthly, such as utilities. When figuring depreciation, treat the property as placed in service on June 1st. So now we've, that's when that would be like if we bought the property and placed it in service or something like that. Similar situation because that's when we uh, put it into the rental side of things from personal side of things. Now we have the basis issue. So it's, so it's like, okay, so now I know when to put it on the books. What am I going to put it on the books for? Because I didn't just buy it basis of property changed to rental use. 
When you change your property, uh, you held for personal use to rental use, for example, you rent your former home, the basis for the depreciation will be the lesser of the fair market value or adjusted basis on the date of conversion. Now, this makes sense if you think about it, because let's say you bought the property a long time ago for $100,000, and now it's going up to $150,000, and you're converting it from personal property to rental property. If you were able to just put it on the books at 150,000, the higher fair market value, you would have gotten what we call a step up in basis, which is a good thing. Usually you would like to be able to do that, but notice what happens now is, is you didn't realize the gain of the 50,000. So usually if you, if you sold the home for 150,000, and you cost 100,000, you'd have a $50,000 gain. That might be exempted in that case if it was your personal residence, but you have that gain situation. And so you can't just wipe out the gain by saying, well, now I'm gonna put it on the books at 150,000 and be able to depreciate and get 150,000 worth of depreciation. Or if I sell the rental property, I've got this stepped up basis. So, so the higher basis is usually good. We wanna have a higher basis and the IRS is, you know, going to be skeptical to step up the basis. So, so that would kind of make sense. Okay. Fair market value FMV. This is the price at which the property would change hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller, neither having to buy or sell and both having reasonable knowledge of all the relevant facts. Now, this is a great idea in concept that we use all the time in practice. It's quite difficult. It's impossible to know because all property is unique. This is real estate. This isn't stocks that are the same. So we can't really, we don't know what that is. That's the problem. So if, so if you allow fair market value to, to be adjusted all the time, you end up with, with act with, a, with people making appraisals and stuff that are too high or too low, depending on what they're trying uh, to do. So we have to use this in concept, this idea of fair market value, but it's not the easiest thing to come to when you're talking about real estate, which is all unique. So sale of similar property on or about the same date may be helpful to figure in the fair market value of the property. Figuring the debt, the basis, the basis for depreciation is the lesser of the fair market value of the property on the date you changed it to rental use or your adjusted basis on the date of the change. That is your original cost or other basis of the property plus the cost of permanent additions or improvements since you acquire it minus deductions for any casualty or theft losses claimed on earlier years income uh, tax returns and other decreases to debt. So notice that thinking about the basis of personal property like a home can be a little bit complex because unlike with rental property, we don't have to track the basis of the home as closely oftentimes. We, it'd be good to do that because when we sell the, our personal home, we might be subject to a gain and we have to deal with that at that point in time. But with rental property, obviously we depreciate the property. So we track it pretty closely with a personal home. Then you've got to make sure that you're, you get the whole basis in there, right? So the basis you would think would be once again, uh, the cost or basis of the property, what you bought the property for, plus the cost of permanent additions or improvements, big, big things that you improved a new roof and that kind of stuff minus deductions for any casualty or theft losses claimed on earlier years income tax return so if you had a loss that you claimed because it went down in value or something like that which is less usual to happen uh and other decreases to the basis so for increase and decreases to basis you can see adjusted basis in chapter two example uh, you originally built a house for $140,000 on a lot that cost $14,000, which you used uh, as your home for many years. Before changing the property to rental use this year, you added $28,000 of, of permanent improvements to the house and claimed a $3,500 casualty loss deduction for the damage to the house. So part of the improvements qualifies for a $500 residential energy credit, which you claimed on a prior year tax return. Because land isn't depreciable, you can only deduct the cost of the house when, uh, when figuring the basis for depreciation. So the adjusted basis for the house at the time of the change in its use was 
uh, 164,000. So we're talking about the house here. So 140,000, you built a house for 140 on a lot that costs 14,000. The lot, the land isn't depreciable. So we're talking about the building here. So we're not adding the 14,000 as a depreciable component. Uh, before changing the property to rental use, you added uh, 28,000. So 28,000 increase because you had permanent improvements to the house and claimed a 3,500 casualty loss. So because we got a benefit from the casualty loss, we're subtracting the benefit, decreasing the basis. Part of the improvements qualified for a 500 residential energy credit. So we're subtracting out the credit. Okay. On the date of the change in use, your property had a fair market value of 168,000, of which 21,000 was for land and 147,000 was for the house. So the basis for depreciation in the house is the fair market value on the date of the change, 147,000, because it is less than uh, your adjusted basis of 164,000. So we have to take the lesser of the two. So we had to figure out our adjusted basis and then we're gonna figure the fair market value. They didn't go into detail on how you figure the fair market value. It's basically, and you know, you could do a, a, an assessment, an appraisal. Let's see, what rhymes with appraisal? I mean, to try to get the fair market value of, of related properties and that kind of stuff. And then we're taking uh, the basis of the property is the fair market value because it is less than the adjusted basis. Corporatives, if you change your corporative apartment to rental use, figure your allowable depreciation as explained earlier. Depreciation methods are discussed in chapter two of this publication and publication 946. On uh, the basis of all the depreciable real property owned by the Corporative Housing Corporation is the smaller of the following amounts. The fair market value of the property on the date you change your apartment to rental use. This is considered to be the same as the corporation's adjusted basis minus straight line depreciation. Unless this value is unrealistic, the corporation's adjusted basis in the property on that date. Don't subtract depreciation when figuring the corporation's adjusted basis. Uh, if you bought the stock after its first offering, the corporation's adjusted basis in the property is the amount figured in one under depreciation earlier. The fair market value of the property is considered to be the same as the corporation's adjusted basis figured in this way minus straight line depreciation unless the value is unrealistic. All right, figuring the, the depreciation deduction. To figure the deduction, use the depreciation system in effect when you convert your residence to rental use. So generally that will be makers for any conversion after 1986. So makers is gonna be our general you know, depreciation methods once we put the depreciable property on the books usually. Treat the property as placed in service on the conversion date. Example, your converted residence, see the previous example under figuring the basis earlier was available for rent on August 1st. Uh, using table 22D, see chapter 2, the percent for year 1 beginning in August is 1.364% and the depreciation deduction for year 1 is 2005. So in other words, once we've determined what the, the, the amount is, the adjusted basis to put the property on the books at and the date to put the property that was converted from personal use on the books, then it's pretty straightforward in that we're we're doing the same kind of thing we did as though we bought the property right because the the difference between purchasing the property and converting the property is the fact that when you purchase the property you know generally pretty well when you bought it and placed it in service and you know generally pretty well what the cost is because you just paid for it when you're converting the property you've got this basis situation that you have to deal with it because you bought it or inherited it or got it in some way in the past and you've got this situation uh, with with the partial year, you know, when you when you placed it in service or when the conversion happened. Once you have those two things, then you're going to put it on the books and you use the similar uh, method for depreciation for that time frame, which is the maker's depreciation. Usually, a, usually a straight line uh, type of depreciation with a half month uh, convention.